very much. Then. You have a local procurement policy at council level. And so I think our, our job today is to say to you that we can help you achieve your triple bottom line. We can help you make the business case for adding the social to the local. I'm sure that many of your locals also add social, but not necessarily so. So procurement is about having money to spend, yes. But um, Peter said to me last night that Marius Kloppers, BHP militant for whom he used to work, said that every dollar of procurement spent is an opportunity for social good. Now that's not, we're not here to talk about charity, ticking the box for corporate social responsibility. We're here to talk about businesses engaging with social enterprises, councils engaging with social enterprises, whom we call social benefit suppliers. I've been involved in this for over a decade. It's, it's not you, but at last it's time has come. So I have Joanne, who has been uh, involved in this at the Parramatta City Council area, although she's now a PhD doctoral candidate. Um, Steve, from, who is the chair of the Queensland Social Enterprise Council, but also runs a social enterprise called C. Peter, who's <coughs> excuse me, from the Gold Coast City Council, who's told us some really interesting things about he, how he goes about it, and I hope he'll be able to share some of that with you today, but a very vocal champion. He's even got a social procurement strategy for the Gold Coast City Council. And Mark, who's from Social Traders today, but came from um, Brotherhood of St. Lawrence and pioneered some really early examples of social procurement. There's literature available on websites, research uh, on good case studies, and a recent one, New South Wales Social Procurement, with some wonderful examples, but even better, a fantastic section on how to make a business case. And that's part of the deal. How to convince those who have the money to spend that they're getting both the economic and social impact of their, the money that they have. Now, Corinne from the National Australia Bank told us last night that NAB has $6 billion to spend on procurement. To their credit, they do things like they change from this cafe to fair trade, tea, coffee and hot chocolate. And that's four and a half million cups across all their branches in Australia. Just imagine the effect of doing something like that. Six billion is only one billion less than the New South Wales government has to spend on social procurement. So what we need this morning, I think, to learn about is why it's a great thing. It's a win-win it's a situation, great value for your ratepayers' dollars. And, um, to learn about how you might become a champion of it, to learn how if you're a social benefit supplier, you might uh, need to uh, do something about making sure that people know you're in the marketplace, etc., etc. Joanne, can we start with you, thanks? Sure, so thank you, Joel. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I'm Joanne McNeil, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Western Sydney. Um, uh, getting close to finishing. 
Um, but uh, previously to that, I was working for the last seven years in Parramatta City Council in Sydney, which is the second CBD of Sydney. Um, a council of about 150,000 people area and quite um, a lot of government entities based there. Uh, one of the things uh, that I managed the social enterprise capacity building program there, um, set it up and tried to work out what that meant within a council focus and then uh, tried lots of different things, some of which were successful and some of less so. One of the key areas for me though, very early on in the process as I started working um, with social enterprises in that capacity, although I had been doing it previously in other capacities, was the very strong recognition that if you, if, without markets, social enterprises don't survive. They don't, they don't grow, they don't thrive, um, and they don't, uh, aren't, can't deliver the social outcomes that there's potential for them to uh, generate into local areas. So a big part of the program became about working on a social security agenda, um, both internally and externally. Um, I would say, um, interestingly, that the external work that I did was probably more visibly successful than the internal work. Um, the internal work within the council um, context was extremely challenging. It's a huge culture shift for council. This is going back quite some time now before social procurement was very well known. Um, but the external work was very successful. It was involved in the, um, the, the steering group for the Australian uh, social procurement research project that Ingrid Burke delivered and partnered with many of the here today. Um, also on the series of the Victorian Guide on Local Government uh, Procurement and then co co-founded the Social Procurement Action Group for New South Wales which uh, delivered that uh, document that Cheryl mentioned which is a fantastic um, next step I suppose in the evolution of the social procurement argumentation um, in Australia. So it really takes the, the uh, level of discussion and debate and guidance to another another level. We hope it's just a step in a long chain and there'll be more that come after this and interpreting that into all sorts of legal, uh, regional contexts and different environments, but that's kind of where it is at the moment. So there's been, um, it, as Cheryl said, it's been a, a very um, a long development journey, I suppose, but it feels like there's a critical mass building around this area now, which is really exciting. Thanks, Joan. So I'm going to go to another council experience here and uh, go to Peter next. Thanks, Cheryl, and uh, good morning, everyone. Well, my name's Peter Morichavitis, and I'm the Chief Procurement Officer for the City of Gold Coast, uh, Australia's second largest council. I guess when we talk about procurement spend, um, you know, we spoke about now having six billion dollars. I previously came from the three bills and an applicant has spent was $25 billion. At the city of Gold Coast, uh, we're about $800 million, but uh, notwithstanding, there's still a significant spend and one which uh, we're able to do social good with. I guess if I take the traditional view of our procurement, it's about, um, I guess, procuring or providing the goods and services for your stakeholders. Um, I guess in the case of the council, it's uh, for my stakeholders to deliver services to the city of Gold Coast. And generally, I guess in a council or a government sense, the word um, at best value is, is always used. I guess um, what I've done in the last couple of years is to try to push the boundaries of best value, and as well as providing those goods and services at the best value, then why can't we get a social outcome out of that procurement spend as well? And over the past 18 months, uh, I guess my role was around developing a strategy for that. And I'm new to government. I've been in the private sector up until the last couple of years. And uh, what I find is that whatever level of government you're at, uh, whether it's local, federal or state, there is a part of your organisation whose role is about social development. At a council level, it's very direct. At the City of Dolcos, we have a branch called Social Development Planning, and their role is about social outcomes. So my view is, there we've got demand, I've got $800 billion to spend, so I've got the supply side. So the strategy for the City of Dolcos was pretty easy. It was all about matching the supply and demand. And after uh, numerous conversations with our social development people, it was about what's their biggest need. And on the Gold Coast, it was two things. One was about providing jobs for disadvantaged people in our disadvantaged groups. 
and secondly, buying local. So our social procurement endeavours are about those two objectives. And what we've done is uh, we've quarantined some categories of spend, and the whole role of taking those to market is to get those social outcomes, as well as some policy arrangements around buying local. So for example, um, our local government access anything under $200,000 you quote anything above $200,000, you tend up. I think in New South Wales it's 150, but threshold any nods yet? Not yet. In Queensland it's 200,000. So basically our policy says anything you quote for below $200,000, you can only go local. Only Gold Coast suppliers. So there's about $250 million quarantined to be spent on the Gold Coast. And for any spent which we tend up above the 200,000 threshold, then the local supplier gets a 15% pricing advantage. And that's, that's as well as um, the, the particular categories of spend which we've now quarantined for a social outcome. So we've um, taken the cleaning to market, we've now made all of our cleaning contracts at about $2 million value per annum. And we basically put that to market with just one criteria. You know, value for money wasn't about price, it was about who could provide the most jobs to disadvantaged people. Um, people out of streams one to four, nods as to what that means. Yep, yep. Probably have Job Service Australia. So who could provide the most jobs to disadvantaged people? One for that tender. And we've just done that now with our, our recycling at our waste transfer stations. And now we're moving on to other categories such as graffiti removal, looking at deep waste, looking at tagging, and testing and uh, some other categories of spend, which are purely quarantined for social good. Fantastic, isn't it? I'm going to go to Mark next because um, Mark bridges that gap between uh, knowing what it takes to be a social benefit supplier and also being in touch with those who want to uh, align their procurement policy with achieving social impact, social outcomes. So Mark, if you could help us on that one. Oh, thanks, Cheryl. Um, my name is Mark Daniels. I'm from Social Traders, which is a social enterprise development organisation based in Melbourne. Um, I uh, have uh, had a lot of exposure to social procurement. I was a, a, a buyer, and then I was a seller, and now I'm an enabler of social procurement. I used to work in uh, public housing in Victoria about uh, 12 years ago, and um, we uh, uh, had a very interesting director of housing at the time, who is now the head of the Business Council of Australia, uh, Jennifer Westacott. We had 95% joblessness on a public housing estate, and uh, she said, why don't you use your procurement to create jobs for public housing tenants? And so we did, over about eight years, we took our joblessness rate from 95% to 81% in that community, largely delivered through changing the way we buy and requiring that public housing tenants got jobs as a result of the uh, contracts that we had. When I went to the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, I, I ran a lot of social enterprises for, for about four years, and social procurement was central to that work. We never started a social enterprise without a contract agreement with someone and we built social enterprises back from the contract. So we used the contract as, as um, I guess, our business plan, and then we built a business to deliver on that contract. Not always the best way to start a business, but it made it, took a lot of the risk out of it for us as an organisation. And in the last five years, I, I've been at Social Traders, and um, we're an enabler. Um, and that means uh, what we do is we encourage and support the development of social enterprise in Australia. And we do that through capability building, but on the other side, we do that by trying to influence demand for social enterprise products and services. And social procurement is a key plank in generating demand for social enterprises. And um, people like um, Cheryl and um, Joe and, and even Peter, uh, Peter's probably heard some of what I've said over the years, but I'm not attributing a what Gold Coast does in any way to what we've said. I'm pretty impressed with what they're doing. Um, what we've done is we've really tried to create uh, resources and a dialogue that encourages social procurement. And we do that in a range of ways. Um, 
with uh, the Centre for Social Impact, um, there was a piece of research into um, social procurement in Australia. It was really quite a seminal piece in 2010. And at the same time, we developed guidelines for social procurement in local government in Victoria. And we did a project coming out of that, which worked with eight local governments in Victoria, and it's called the Expert Support Program. And it was really designed to just assist them in undertaking social procurement. It was such a foreign concept to a lot of people, because fundamentally what we're saying is, um, uh, to a process group, a process driven group of people who fear auditors quite significantly, we were saying we'd like you to change the way, the criteria through which you make your decisions. And to do that, you needed evidence. You needed a lot of evidence. And uh, so the first concern people had was, um, it's illegal. You can't do that. And so we took every point that they raised. It's illegal. It's not good value for money. Da -da 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 -da. And in the guidelines, we responded to all of those comments and said, well, you can actually do it. We got advice from the Solicitor uh, General in Victoria who said, yes, you can do this within these constraints and so forth. So the guidelines were quite seminal. The practice started from there in Victoria, in particular New South Wales developed guidelines and following up from that. Um, and recently we started a, a new organisation, something incorporated called Social Procurement Australasia. And the idea of that is to create a home for resources on social procurement um, and to build networks. It's got a strong government focus. But we've also been working with corporates. It's clearly, it's not just government that can enable this, and we've heard that out of the discussions today. Um, Corporate Australia uh, is engaging in this. We're just about to release some research on corporate social procurement in Australia. I would note that NAB is case study in that as an example. So is Telstra, so is Rio Tinto, so is Transfield, so is Tease, and they're all doing stunning things and collectively we're spending over 900 million a year on social procurement. So there's a lot that can be done. And, uh, and what came out of that were what are the enablers to make this a lot easier moving forward. I just want to finish my comment on my five minutes of, of in the spotlight, and just to finish by saying, um, I actually think that social procurement is the greatest untapped resource for social change. And I don't think people are thinking of, have actually made that leap. But we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars in Australia alone that is not being used to deliver social impact. This is new money. This is not just reconfiguring the way you know, we've bought social services. This is new money delivering different outcomes. And I think it has to be seen in that light. It is quite transformational and it is a massive untapped Thank you, Mark. Couldn't agree more. So we're here to come to you a minute, Steve. We're here to say to you, we need to challenge this orthodoxy about value for taxpayers or ratepayers' money being that single dimensional financial focus that we've all grown up with. And secondly, I think if, if we're having success at the local government level, um, we can all be champions of moving that up right up to the federal government level where they do have Indigenous um, procurement policies, but I really don't believe they have that that holistic, triple bottom line social impact inclusion when they talk about it. And um, I'm going to ask the panellists in a minute to pick one really stunning case study to talk about where you'll learn something from the way they went about it. But first we're going to hear from Steve, who's who runs a social enterprise uh, in, in Queens, in Brisbane, out of Brisbane. Bayside. And uh, he can give you the perspective of someone who's out there with a service to offer uh, and how he might go about bringing that, what might be perhaps the obstacles to bringing that to contract level. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. All right. Yes, I, I'm from Queensland, so I've got a bit of jet lag. I'm coming down the right way. I'm here to help. Yeah. So I come really with two hats on today. So as Cheryl said, I run a small social enterprise called SEED. Um, and I'm also chair of the Queensland Social Enterprise Council, which is, as far as we know, the only, the first and only democratically elected peak body for social enterprise in Australia. So 
We're very happy about that. We've looked, we launched this year to uh, much fanfare, and uh, you know we're here to represent social enterprise and to liaise with um, with stakeholders, so government bodies and corporates and academics around social enterprise. So SEED is uh, a social enterprise that is probably quite a traditional model of social enterprise. It's based at a community centre, it's a program of a, uh, a not-for-profit, yeah, not for a good not-for-profit, but a not-for-profit that, yeah. that provides a variety of services, for example in domestic violence um, work and disability work. SEED, SEED only exists to create employment for long-term and employ people. And it was developed as a way to employ people who were hanging out at the community centre and were consistently going through training programmes and education programmes, but would then just end up back on the dole. You know, they, they couldn't ever sustain employment. So the organisation said, well, how can we work with these people alongside them to help them? So they developed SEED. And SEED provides landscape maintenance services, uh, domestic gardening services, and commercial cleaning services to quite a wide range of customers. We've been going for, a, we're now in our fourth year, and our first contract is actually a piece of social procurement, and it's quite a famous piece of social procurement in the sector. It's the Brisbane City Council Parks Procurement Project. Um, that was where Brisbane City Council decided that they could quarantine out a number of parks and offer it to four different enterprises, all fledgling enterprises, and SEED was one of those. So we started with uh, that contract and we've grown tenfold in four years. So we've seen some huge growth in our little enterprise and we've been able to employ lots of people. We currently employ about 12 people. The majority of whom come from a disadvantaged background in some sense. So they might be from a refugee community, they might have a mental illness, they might have a disability. And we make sure that we buddy people up with you know, highly qualified and skilled horticulturalists and cleaners where, where it is appropriate. So I can only agree with everything that the, you know, the other panelists have said on social procurement. It is the answer to the social entrepreneurs, you know, dreams, problems, nightmares, you know, it's a way to create massive social impact just by using the dollar. But from a small, speaking from, some, you know, as somebody who runs a small social enterprise, it's really not as easy as that. And unfortunately, it doesn't actually, often these bigger contracts are filtered down and into the grassroots level. And although on the council, I'll just switch back to the, the council we do, although on the council we represent a, a wide range of social enterprises. So we've got, um, you know, Boys Town are members, Health Enterprises are, are members, which is probably all now quite huge organisations, but we've also got sole entrepreneurs who are starting social enterprises. So we, we, we cover the, the wide range. And a lot of these big contracts really don't filter down to that grassroots level. And it's the grassroots level, I think, that is the backbone of the social enterprise economy. It's, it's entrepreneurs who are saying, hey, let's do something different. Let's try and change the world using enterprising means. And we can see that um, really blossoming through things like the school for social entrepreneurs. Um, lots and lots of people coming through saying how do we want to change the world, how do we do it, we've got these business ideas, let's do it. So they're starting from a very start-up uh, grassroots culture. I see that there's three main issues uh, in social procurement for social enterprises at the moment. The first one is that there is there's distinctly a lack of vendors available. So although we've heard these great stories, and uh, you know, I agree they're great stories, um, and they're very, very positive. Um, there is actually a lack of tenders that are out there that are specifically social tenders. Then there's a lack. Even when there are tenders available, there's a lack of tenders that are of the right size. So, I'll give an example. Um, if uh, if Brisbane City Council want to clean um, their thirty stories, how are they? 
There's actually no social enterprise with the capacity to do that currently, I think, in Brisbane. So it's about how do how do they go about organising their procurement so that, so that it enables smaller enterprises to compete. So in that instance with the 30 story tower block, the, the most simple option for us, or in my view, would be to quarantine out to say two top drawers and that could go to a social enterprise. And you can still set up competitive tendering in that example because you can quarantine out the two top drawers and you can seek tenders from you know three or four different social enterprises. So it's still it's still it's still a competitive model. The next problem is a, a lack of knowledge. So there's a, there is um, still a, you know, a distinct lack of knowledge in, in procurement circles. And that's not just in government, but that's, that runs right through from you know, corporate uh, procurement people um, and even in the not-for-profit sector. You know, the not-for-profit not sector, as I'm sure you all know here, is a huge sector, massive spending power. And they're still not buying, we're still not buying from each other. So we still regularly go to um, meet large shop for profits and say, hey, who's doing your cleaning? Who's doing your gardening? Who's doing your maintenance? And it's a private company. And it's too difficult often for those people with the buying power to say, okay, we'll change our contract. So I think, you know, just to reiterate, there's, there's three issues in my view. Is, is capacity in the sector, uh, a, lack of non, a lack of tenders and uh, a lack of knowledge. Thank you very much, Steve. You've probably already heard a couple of key, key issues. Um, waiting, social causes, which I hope you'll talk about here to as an example. And Steve talked about what, what we call disaggregating contracts. So do two floors. Allow someone to do two floors of cleaning and not, not insist on 30. Um, you can still make the business case for that, I believe. Now, I've asked each one to do just, say, a two-minute synopsis of um, some, their, one of their favourite case studies, which will illustrate some of the characteristics of social procurement. We'll start with you, Joanne. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk to you about the Brisbane it's, I think, relevant here because of the regional approach they've taken to how they um, uh, develop this particular social human and social enterprise network. Um, so it's called Komoti. Um, don't ask me what that stands for because it's something in Flemish. Um, but basically it's a, uh, the reuse centres. There's 31 reuse centres across the Flanders region that divert waste to landfill. But the great example of how social and environmental outcomes can be achieved together. Um, they, the numbers are staggering, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but the, it's in the you know, thousands of tonnes of diversion from landfill. They've also employed uh, thousands of people into the extreme centres and through the network who are from the most hard to reach and hard to employ groups of people. Um, and they're now Europe's most uh, successful and largest social franchise as they have provided them on the across the region more fully. Now, all of the reuse centres are independent, that's really an important part of the model because they actually retain their autonomy and they're actually all managed locally. So from a regional perspective, you can actually um, see how you can actually create that on the ground local level um, involvement and engagement, but at the same time, they have an overarching body which is mostly, which works to coordinate their efforts. Um, importantly, it does all of the works with them on the joint branding and positioning of their initiatives. So it, where there used to be a whole lot of little dusty sort of hot shop type things, which I'm sure you all know from your own experience, they've now become these trendy, well positioned, really kind of um, nice places to be that are selling all of this pre-loved material, furniture, clothes, everything across the board. Um, so, the other thing that Komosi does for the network is actually helps with the joint lobbying around policy development to plan this government. So this initiative has been supported over many years and is a long range one where they've actually worked with the Waste Management Agency, OFAM, and 
in the employment agency in Flanders government to actually work across those government silos, which is unusual in itself, to actually uh, identify ways that they can, through their contract delivery, um, assist over time with the incubation of this approach. So this is a long-term development plan that's been going on for over 10, well over 10 years and it's now resulted in this really solid network of um, these amazing centres which are doing this terrific work. Now, it wouldn't have happened without the involvement of those two public sector agencies, recognising that they had uh, potential to combine their, their outcomes that they were looking for and look for ways to support um, a particular approach to, to delivering on those objectives. The other important part of that, that process, um, which I think is worth mentioning here today, is that through their contracting process, they allow for and in fact encourage the establishment and growth of the Kamosi umbrella entity itself. Now in Australia, this is a huge issue because we, we don't have um, ways of financing our infrastructure organisations in this space. So um, at the moment, we really struggle to get resources into things like the Social um, Enterprise Council in Queensland and many others around the country that are trying to find their feet. The testament of this model is that if you actually do invest in those, those uh, infrastructure bodies that can help to coordinate, lobby, bring to get people together, manage decision making processes and the like, that you can really accelerate and strengthen these kinds of approaches. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so, Joanne introduced another term there social franchising. So, just think franchising but with a social purpose outcome. Um, not widely developed in Australia, but, but an important part of um, the way in which small, small can cooperate together and achieve scale. Um, we might go to you next, please. Uh, the example I want to touch upon is um, not just cleaning, because uh, Steve um, gave his view of that, and um, I guess the great thing about a company like this is that there are different views, and I guess I'm a buyer, and uh, Steve's a seller, so you get, you get both views. Um, before I do, I just want to go back to our strategy, because at the end of the day, um, unless you have a strategy, then it's very, very hard to, to meet your objectives. And if I, if I go back to our primary strategy, it was all about creating jobs for the long-term unemployed. And why? I mean, at that point in time when we started 18 months ago, I mean, what did I know? I knew unemployment nationally was 5.6%. I knew unemployment in Queensland was 6.3%. Unemployment on the Gold Coast was 6.7%. So here I am with $800 million to spend, and uh, I guess it's probably arrogant enough to think that I can single-handedly decrease the unemployment rate on the Gold Coast. So I guess not a bad objective. In saying that, um, Many months ago, we started our first initiative, which was office cleaning. And if I now look, I guess I spoke about the, uh, the, the, the what's of our strategy. If I speak about the how, then if I take what I call the spectrum of uh, social procurement, at one end of the spectrum, you can put your toe in the water. You can have social clauses in contracts. You can get single quotes from social enterprises. You can try and force some social uh, benefits subcontracting. Right at the other end of the spectrum is what I would call social benefits provider procurement, and that is you know, jumping right into the deep end, and as I mentioned, actually quarantining and spend and just applying that for social purposes to social enterprises. Because um, I'm a believer at the moment, rightly or wrongly, and um, some people might disagree with this, that the social enterprises market isn't developed enough in Australia, or, or, or at least on the Gold Coast, for social enterprises to compete with your normal business. So the real key in any strategy is how do you level that playing field? And, uh, that's the way I did it. It took a lot of work. It took, um, it took about 12 months to get this across the line. It was um, leveling the playing field was very easy because I would exclude the general business. Then there's, there's no issue with competing against the social enterprises. The so national competition policy. Uh, a lot of work to, uh, <laughs> to weigh through that. But uh, it can be done. It can be done. And you didn't put it in down, it has been, I guess. Um, if I go back to, if I go back to office cleaning, 
we went big bang, you know, jumping into the deep end. Uh, we had about 10 office cleaning contracts for all our council facilities, ranging from ranging from council chambers uh, right through to libraries and uh, swimming pools and uh, community centres. What we did is we aligned the termination dates to bring that all together into one tender. When we hit the market about 12 months ago, we have $2 million worth of spend per annum. Now, I guess Steve's right, um, you know, that is too big for a social enterprise, so we broke that up into, I think remember it was 12 separate portions. So that gave the opportunity for 12 different providers to get a portion of that. And that went out as a tender to just social enterprises. That was our, our, our leap of faith and uh, you know, we, we really entered some uncharted waters on the Gold Coast and uh, from a social enterprise perspective, that was an absolute failure because uh, what we quickly realised was the social enterprise market on the Gold Coast wasn't mature enough to uh, even have enough suppliers to tender. However, what we did, which ultimately was a raising success, is that we forced the normal cleaning companies to be able to meet our requirements by providing jobs through that tender to long-term unemployed people. So there was only one evaluation criteria. Who could provide the most jobs for people in stream one to four? Um, the JSA stream one to four or the, um, the, the, the DES um, funding level is one to two. And uh, if you were able to provide a job to a stream four person, you got more points than a, a stream one person. And that's the, um, the the result of that was that that tender was awarded to four different companies. So the twelve separate proportions were split across four different companies. The total number of jobs for that tender was about sixty jobs. And we got to the point of where 30 of them were people who were in screens one to four, um, over half of those in screen four. So I guess as a, as a venture into a, a tender which was just for social enterprises, we uh, achieved our outcome in a different way. But at the end of the day, it was about providing jobs to the long-term unemployed, and uh, that was successful. Thank you, Mark. Uh, really quickly, just a slightly different view. Um, Rio Tinto uh, spends uh, seven billion dollars in WA. They made a decision in 2010 that uh, up to 15 percent of their total spend is an aspirational target would be with Indigenous business. In 2012, 2.3 billion dollars of their spend was to Indigenous business. So the change was very quick and they helped build 100 of those indigenous businesses in to, to their supply base. So, you know, quite stunning. Transfield services, a uh, big maintenance provider, has taught social enterprises in their supply chain. Um, you know, the, the, the quantum and, and uh, the impact of change can be huge. Telstra moved from um, cleaning, uh, using uh, conventional cleaning companies and maintenance businesses to maintain their, social, their uh, phone exchanges. They only use not-for-profit organisations to provide jobs for people with disabilities, and they've created 300 jobs for people with disabilities, one change. So we've had a spectrum here from a, how a corporate um, sector can look at or re-look at their purchasing power, and we've looked at councils. Now you've told us a little bit, Steve, already about C. Can you just pick up one thing that Steve does, one of your contracts that you think works really, really well? Yeah, um, and this is a positive one, so I don't want to sound too negative all the time. Oh, no, no, I feel like I'm a depressive on the, on the panel. Um, but I do probably agree. I mean, I think Pete is a visionary. Well, he, he is a visionary. And I, you know, he, he, he's unusual. <laughs> he's a visionary and he's undoubtedly created a lot of employment for people who are going for four. That, that's undoubtedly. So, you know, we really need to applaud him for that. And go for a city council. So, a quick example of a, a good procurement uh, 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 contract for seed uh, was with the what was called the Urban Land Development Authority in Queensland. It's now called 
the economic development Queensland, renamed by the new government. Um, and that was a, a kind of quasi-government uh, development body. Um, and, and the key to this being a good, a good procurement um, example is that it was a negotiated contract. So UOBA knew that they needed to um, plant 14,000 native plants on an area of land which is called a fund, which is a water detention basin, and it ran for 1.3 kilometres through some bushland. So somebody at ULBA thankfully said, hey, it's in our charter that we should be uh, creating employment for local people. Let's find out how to do that. So they approached uh, Sandbag, which is our overarching organisation, and we got involved. And it took an awfully long time to negotiate the contract. But the key is, we got the contract. We were able to employ, I think, 16 people, many of whom went on to uh, get employment with other uh, employers, and some of whom are still employed with us today. So the key there is really is, is the negotiated temper process. Okay, it's over to you. Um, we'll have to do some voice throwing uh, if we need to ask something from far away from us, but, oh, here's a radio mic. Is there anybody who would like to uh, tease out further any of these aspects? Thank you. Well, you're a social provider in a way, aren't you? Very, very important. Do you want to say who you are? Uh, James Ward from my home. Hello, David. Um, Question for Peter. If, in theory, if it takes, say, a thousand hours to, to clean a swimming pool complex, and you let that contract to a company that's going to uh, employ unemployable people, straightforward, so, and it takes a thousand hours. Now, what do we do with a thousand hours of cleaning that a cleaning company employing, employing cleaners? What do we do with those people? Is it sort of shifting the debt I, I look at this philosophically. Um, at the end of the day, I've been in procurement all my career. Um, if I take an average year on the Gold Coast, we'll do 250 major tenders, and there's winners and there's losers. So in the normal tender process, you've got organisations who lose, a lot of those organisations, it affects their livelihood as well as their employees. I see this no different. So I don't see, again, um, with respect, I don't see that as an excuse not to take this part. Sure, I, I, I take that on board. And probably a, a, a philosophically a better way, a good way to look at it is if you're employing, you're, you're keeping out from the gate. Um, people have been employed from outside the Gold Coast. And I think that if you can combine uh, the Gold Coast companies only employing Gold Coast people, and if there's a shortfall, then you're bringing in unemployable people to that and making them employable. That's where it really works. Sure, sure. And um, I think as I mentioned, there's two parts of our strategy. One part is to buy local. And as I mentioned, uh, any in which is a quote under twenty thousand dollars is local only. Anything above local organisations get a fifteen percent pricing advantage. So I guess the first priority is to buy local, and then secondly, within our local pool, with our potential employees to assist those who are long-term unemployed. Any other questions, please? I guess I'm probably thinking more about the people with disabilities, maybe than um, you know, other unemployed people, and there is a strong movement about actually not clustering people with disabilities in work environments together. So I, I guess I'm sort of commenting in that context. Yeah, look, my only comment would be, um, you're not alone. I think there's a move towards that. I think the government through uh, whatever facts is called now, the Department of Social Services is um, encouraging that amongst disability enterprises by uh, their, 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 their direction. Um, and I think most social enterprises have relatively integrated workplaces because you need, uh, you need people who are, are, are not the target group working alongside people who are the target group in order to, to deliver a little bit of service. One of the comments I want to make before, because um, we are going to but well, I want to raise this. I think one of the challenges in social procurement that we haven't quite 
um, mastered yet is the uh, measuring the value of social killing, the added value that's created by social fulfillment. I think it's the killer punch, and I think once we do that, it will become much more widespread in government because at the moment, compared to the lead contract, and I know the clean contract at uh, uh, Gold Coast actually was cheaper than uh, what the estimated price was. A lot of, and you expected it to be more expensive, people, and you allocated money for it to be more expensive, it came in cheaper. Um, but you can't generalise and say that it should be cheaper, that it will be cheaper. I think on average you probably assume it will be a little bit more expensive sometimes, i.e. 5% or 5 to 10. But what the argument that needs to be communicated is that 10% is creating this much value for your organisation or for government or for society and that's what you're um, ultimately investing in. And that's where um, I guess the state level and some of the governments and federal and, and the other domains, it's still the killer argument. For treasurers is we're actually getting better value. Now intuitively we know we're getting better value, but financially uh, it needs to be demonstrated better than we've been able to demonstrate so far. I'd just like to thank before we finish because I think it's really important. The function balance that we're giving here now are employment related. It's really important to note that social procurement is not all about employment. There's lots of social procurement activity that ha happens which is, has other social and or environmental objectives. Um, and particularly for local governments, you come from a local government background, um, particularly smaller local governments, that's really important because um, you actually you try to make a case internally in your council that this is about employment outcomes, it's a very difficult one to sell because the benefits to around employment don't accrue back to the local government level, other than obviously engaged sentiment. Um, so I guess I just wanted to make that point. Um, I think it's also really important to think about how you can be achieving multiple outcomes at the same time, particularly in the region, um, which I understand from some local conversation yesterday afternoon like this, where underemployment is actually a really big issue, um, if, I, if I understand that correctly, that it's not necessarily just about the very hard to reach and to employ, it's actually about creating um, employment for a much broader cross-section of the population than that. And that's a really important um, factor in terms of how you think about how you might want to structure your social procurement activities and the focus and emphasis of those in terms of the types of social criteria and things you would include in contracts. So I just wanted to sort of broaden that out a little bit again to make sure we're not leaving people to be interested in this just about employing very hard to work um, groups. I think that's a very important point, John. Um, I guess we've been responding to one of the unmet um, social needs in this regional area, but that is a really important point. I wouldn't want you either to go away with the impression that this is just another way of dealing with uh, entrenched uh, long-term unemployment, because it isn't. And I know businesses, social businesses and social enterprises that do all sorts of things like um, relieve uh, the lack of access to clean drinking water, for example, elsewhere in the world. So, um, just to sum up, because I know we're being whipped along to get to the, the symposium, some of the key points that I think our speakers made this morning was Joanne saying without markets, social enterprises don't, don't survive. That's a really key understanding to take away. We might go away with good intentions, but that's not enough. We have to do what we can to build markets. Um, from Peter, um, the way in which governments at the local level, local government can actually reconsider the way it uh, tenders and disaggregating tenders and social clauses, those things are very important. From uh, Steve, another question on the kind of tenders that are available, are they of the right size? Uh, we had some fantastic examples um, of case studies from all the, across the sectors. And, and from Mark, just that exhortation to all of you with the capacity to do something about this, to understand that it's perfectly legal. It is about value. I think you can say it's almost added value for the money spent. It can be done. People are doing it. And we're really delighted to see so many people in the Northern Rivers who are opening their minds to possibly 
uh, starting this, championing this, even in a small way. So thank you very much for your attendance this morning, and I hope we see most of you at the symposium.